this morning, this afternoon, or this evening, wherever you are and whenever you're watching this broadcast. But what we know that it's a great thing to give him what he's due. Come on, put those hands on him. Blessed be the rock 
children's children. He's a Lord over my life. Lord over my life. I don't have to worry. I don't have to fret. He's a God that's in control. He's a God that's in control. He's the God that's in control. He's a God that's in control. Come on, let's praise him. Come on, let's praise him. Come on, say this, say Come on, let's praise him. 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 Come on, let's worship. Come on, let's worship. Hey, come on, let's lift him. Come on, let's worship. Come on, let's praise him. Come on, let's praise him. Now, come on, shout. Come on, let's praise him. Come on, let's praise him. Come on, let's pray. Come on, let's pray. Come on, let's pray. I'll never cease from worshiping my King. No, you can't block me. You can't stop me. I can't stop praising. I can't stop lifting him. Come on, let's pray. Come on, let's pray. Come on, let's pray. your voice, give him the honor, give him the glory, and give him all the praise. Hey. Hallelujah. Yes, this is the day that the Lord has made, and I don't know about you, but I'm going to give him what he's due. Somebody help me praise the Lord. Today's prayer focus is going to come from 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 3 and 4. It reads, The God of Israel spoke. The rock of Israel said to me, When one rules over people in righteousness, when he rules in the fear of God, he is like the light of morning at sunrise, on a cloudless morning, like the brightness after rain that brings grass from the earth. So today, we're gonna pray for the Supreme Court. Many times, especially in today's times, it may feel like our lives are in other people's hands. We know that God rules, but we wanna pray for the Supreme Court because they make decisions for us and we want it to feel like the light of morning at sunrise. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you rule over the earth. And we thank you for the structures that you have put into place to help us. We pray that those who are, hold the important seats in government, in the Supreme Court, will rule with righteousness and reverence for you. We pray that if there is any corruptness, that you will replace it with righteousness. And we trust that you will do what is best for us each and every day and that you will cause what's best for us to happen. Lord, 
we trust you ultimately and we thank you that we need not worry but we can find confidence in you we honor you and we thank you and we love you in jesus name Gracious greetings and welcome to another broadcast of Grace for the Nation's Church. Here at Grace, we of course believe there's always hope and we've gone through quite a few different changes and iterations in the world today. So I think it's timely for us to share a word from God. I believe that this time that we're living in right now is so unprecedented that we really don't have very many um, measuring sticks or any type of uh, thing to compare it to, but I do know that God is in control of everything. Why don't you share this, like this, start perhaps a watch party, let somebody know that we're talking about some very relevant and pertinent things regarding the kingdom of God and how we, the believers, the people who've been born again, blood washed, um, should be uh, active and proactive in this whole process. I wanna encourage everybody to register to vote, take advantage of your opportunity to register, and then of course exercise your right uh, to vote in this coming election. We never Never tell people who to vote for, whether you are a Democrat, a Republican, a liberal, or a conservative, that's, that's between you and your God. But I do believe that the Bible clearly tells us that it's God who sets up one and takes down another. And he does that in this uh, uh, state or this uh, country that we live in through the power of our voting. So I want to strongly encourage everyone to get out and to vote, register to vote. If you want to see change, you have to, of course, voice your change through your vote. It's not just the presidential election this year. There are lots of Senate seats and there's Congress persons being voted in and there's some local governmental positions that are being voted. So we want you to make sure you take some time to do that. And then I also want to remind everybody to take advantage of the opportunity to do your census, mycensus.gov. I believe you can go and register for the census. That information is important for districting, for not only voting districts, but also for allocations and resources that are distributed to local communities. And I strongly encourage my brothers and sisters for Grace for the Nation's Church, or even wherever you are, to take advantage of these opportunities that we have now to voice through voting, voice through voting. There's a campaign called Take Your Soul to the Poll, and it's a, it's a campaign or an effort to get Christians to really exercise their voice, especially in this day and time that we're in. We've been in similar situations where there needed to be acts on civil rights, where there needed to be justice exacted through our voice of protest, peaceful protest, but voting is absolutely one of the best ways for us to communicate how we feel. So I think I've said vote probably about 30 times just in these few seconds. So uh, that's what we're going to do, am I right? Amen. Well, get your Bibles. We're going to jump into this message and we're going to share from the word of the Lord. Hopefully you had a chance to do some liking, some sharing, or maybe even a watch party, but we're going to pray and then we'll get right into the word of the Lord. Father, we thank you for another day. It's a day you've made. We're rejoicing and we're glad, glad to be alive, glad to have life and health and strength and all the things that pertains to life and godliness. According to your word, you've provided. And if we have lack or need, we just simply ask of you. We thank you because you've been faithful and committed to your people throughout the years, and even today you never fail. So we ask that you would bless this word and bless the hearers of the word. I pray that every preacher, teacher, apostle, prophet, evangelist that's sharing your word right now would be illuminated with power, and he who has an ear, let them hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying unto the church. In your son Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, again, thanks for tuning in. I'm going to be sharing with you um, from quite a few passages of scripture, some Old Testament stuff, and I hope you're going to get your Bibles um, and follow along, do some highlighting, some underlining, and um, allow this word to saturate you. Let's go to the book of Isaiah. We'll start in the book of Isaiah. Um, the Old Testament scriptures are always dear to me because they lay the foundation for not only what we're experiencing right now, but it also guides us from our past to our future. In Isaiah, the second chapter, Isaiah, the second chapter, it simply says, this is what Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. 
In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established. As the highest of the mountains, it will be exalted above the hills, and all nations will stream to it. Many people will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between nations and settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Come descendants of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. So in Isaiah, the prophet is speaking a word that is applicable to today, but it was in reference or in context, the children of Israel's plight, that they were in a situation where there was wars, rumors of wars, fighting, there was defeat, and oftentimes a lot of dismay. We're living in a time now where we see that, and the, the wars happen to be civil. They happen to be right within our own communities, right within our governments, and against our own nations within this nation. And we can relate to this, and I often try to take and adapt scripture to fit to current times. But even if we look at it historically, God's word and God's promise not only came true, but it also has hope within it. It just simply says that all these things have happened, but in the last days, the last days of the war, last days of this year, the last days of what we're experiencing right now, we're coming to the close. I feel it strongly that we're coming to the close of an age and an era, another time. And it's important for us to be able to look at scripture and distinguish how does it apply to us and how does does it fit? So the prophet speaks about the mountain of the Lord, and the title of this message is Mountains and Valleys. Mountains and Valleys. He speaks of the mountain of the Lord. There are very um, many different mountains, institutions, establishments that have been um, set up by God, various governmental um, things in the spirit realm. And one of them is the mountain of the, the Lord's house, the, the church itself. There's, there's arts, there's commerce, there's business and trade. There's so many different things that we can look at from the perspective a prophetic perspective, but I want to focus in on the mountains and the valleys that we're experiencing. Think for a moment about these last nine months. We're going into the 10th month. Think for a moment about how it has been up and down. I mean, it's been tumultuous terrain um, to try to navigate unknown spaces and to not know what to do next and to have to abide by um, governmental mandates regarding quarantines and, and various things like social distancing or wearing masks in public places. And we've got so many different things that we're dealing with, and it's like traversing the terrain of a mountain, a very rocky mountain, a hard mountain, and we'll talk more about mountains. But then there's also these valleys that we experience. We, we experience these valleys where we hear the news of another person passing or another injustice that has been exacted upon a specific group of people. We're talking Black Lives Matter and people are arguing with an echo dissent that all lives matter. Do you think that God is concerned about somebody singling themselves out when if we have an injustice to any people, it's an injustice to all people? So, so when we think about the arguments, we, we think about the debates, we think about the highs and the lows, we can liken them unto the mountains and the valleys the mountains and the valleys. I want to get you to another passage of scripture. It's also in the Old Testament. It's in Psalms and it's familiar because many of us quote it often, maybe one of the earlier scriptures that you've learned in your early days. It's, um, it, it comes from the book of Psalms. I believe it is, I will get to it for you. It's Psalms 121, Psalms 121. Starting at the first verse in the King James Version of the Bible, it says, I will lift up mine eyes into the hills from whence cometh my help for my help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved, nor, or, nor, excuse me, he will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will neither slumber nor sleep. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. That's the new King James Version of the Bible. I was quoting from memory, and like I said, many of us learn that scripture, but what does it mean to lift our eyes to the hills, to the hills from which cometh our help? Let me establish three things. There are mountains, there are hills and there are valleys. There are mountains, the mountain of the Lord's house. These are entities of governmental structure, power and influence in the earth, mountains. And then there are hills, there are hills. These are resting places before you get to the highest mountain, but not in the place 
of the valley. So we've got valleys, we have hills, and we have mountains. Sometimes those hills can be considered summits or plateaus. In fact, the hills of the Lord are often talked about in the scripture. And Psalms tells us in um, the 24th Psalms, um, the question is asked, who shall ascend unto the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? He that has clean hands and a pure heart who's not lifted up his soul unto vanity. So there are hills and there are places of dwelling in which the Lord meets his people that we identify with geographically. I think about the valleys of Kidron and the, the, the various brooks and valleys that were spoken of in the Old Testament. And those were geographical places on the earth that had some spiritual significance. Just as now we are experiencing some very spiritual things regarding peaks and valleys or hills. And there's got to be some geography associated with it as well. Why here in America are we having such an injustice uh, surge, a surge of injustice being brought to the forefront. It can't just be because social media has documented or recorded it. It can't be just because um, a few people have spoken out. This has been going on for years and years and generations and generations. And it's happened in 1968. It's happened in 2020. We're experiencing so many things that seem to be a repeated cycle or ups and downs. One minute there's accomplishment and another minute there's setbacks. One minute there is victory and freedom. And another minute it seems to be obstruction and there seems to be uh, um, damnable things happening even to the people of God, the church. Let's focus in on the church. I want to focus on the people of God because the people of God are the most important element in this argument or this process of what is the Lord doing. The people of God are, is his, his concern. It's, it's you, it's me, it's the believers, it's people who are the apple of his eye, the, the very thought and the intent of God's heart. You see, he formed us, he knew us, he shaped us, he made us, but he chose now to put us in the earth. And so when we think about the hill in the valleys, the psalmist says, I will lift mine eyes to the hills from which cometh my help, which distinguishes that perhaps he was in a valley. Many of you may be in a valley. Sometimes I experience valleys. We all experience low places in our route to the top, to the mountain of God, to the ascension of the hill of the Lord, or to the most holy place, or being in his presence, or everything being all right. I hope this is, is, is pretty plain to you that we're going to experience in our lives hills and valleys, and God speaks to us prophetically. Let's go back to Isaiah. I want to show you, some, show you something in the scripture that the Lord spoke regarding hills and valleys and his promise. Come on, somebody say promise. You can even type it in the chat if you like. God's promise toward us has always been consistent. God has never failed on what it is that he said that he was going to do for his people. And the promises that he's made to his children are coming to pass despite some experiencing valleys and some experiencing mountains. We'll talk a little bit more about the hill in just a moment. But when we look at the hills, the valleys, the mountains, um, Isaiah 54, Isaiah 54, it's a, it's, a, it's a prophetic word about the future of Zion. Remember when we read there in, in the uh, earlier verses, of Isaiah, Isaiah 2, um, it talked about Zion being the place of God's judgment, the church, Zion being the people in which God was going to exact his not only promises, but also his wrath would come to or through Zion, his chosen people, Zion, the people of God that are the church of God. Now, not a denomination or a group that is partisanly um, uh, set off aside or different than this one and fighting that one, but we're talking people who have been blood washed and brought with the price, the precious blood of Jesus. And so Zion, that's you, that's me, that's us, that's believers everywhere. We're talking people of every nationality. We're talking people of every kindred, every tongue, and every language, people of every background, every walk of life, young, old, rich, poor, black, white, every net nationality will be represented in what God identifies as Zion. So Zion is being established in the earth and despite our, our mountains and our valleys, he's calling for Zion to be a mountain among them. There's a geographical location called the Mount of Zion. And the Mount of Zion is referenced oftentimes as the place where people met their God. People meet God at Zion. So this is a compelling indictment that the church has to be lifted again. In the midst of all that's up and down, the church has to be lifted. And the best way to do that is to find in the scripture what God has to say about us. Here's a time in scripture where Isaiah prophesies again, the 54th chapter, he prophesies to the glory of Zion. He says the sing barren women, you have never bore a child, burst into song, shout for joy. You who were never in labor because more are the children of desolate women than her who has a husband, says the Lord. Which means that even though we're in a down 
position, even though it appears that we are in a, a, a position of mournfulness, he says rejoice. Even though you don't see the promise just yet, rejoice. Even though we haven't manifested the full uh, manifestation of what he has promised, rejoice as a barren woman would be in expectation that she will bring forth even more than those who had been fruitful. It says this in the second verse, enlarge in the place of your tent and stretch your tent's curtains wide. Do not hold back, he says. Lengthen your cords, strengthen your stakes. Verse number three says, for you will spread out to the right and to the left. Your descendants will dispossess nations and settle in their desolate cities. This is the part that I want to give you comfort on as we begin, begin to close this message. This verse here, verse number four says, do not be afraid. You will not be put to shame. You will not be put to shame. Do not fear disgrace. You will not be humiliated. He says, you will forget the shame of your youth and remember no more the reproach of your widowhood. Now that's interesting because he goes on to speak of this dynamic of a relationship of a husband, a wife, a mother who was barren and now bearing children. Think for a moment about that being an ultimate manifestation of promise that God shows us and he makes good on his word that we're not going to be uh, completely diminished even in the midst of, of pandemics, in the midst of what's happening around us. There's a hope that Zion has, that the church has, that's on the mountaintop, although we're experiencing valleys. I strongly believe that we're experiencing a change, a shifting that's going to require some loss before we can have our gains. I believe there's a shifting that's taking place in governments that we're going to have to have some poor government in order for the righteousness of God to eventually reign in governmental places. I believe that we're going to have to have some disappointments so that we can appreciate the things that have been accomplished over our years. And, and God is not a God that does a tit for tat kind of thing, but God's word will never fail us. One more prophecy, one more prophetic word, and it is in the book of Romans. The author of the book of Romans, this is New Testament, and it applies to us even today. In the eighth chapter, one of my favorite chapters in the book of, in the whole entire Bible, it says this in verse number one, it says, I'm convinced this is a new international version. Um, in the King James, it says, for I reckon. I, I don't know that there are many people reckoning these days, but, but we'll read it in the, in the uh, new international version. It says, for I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor things present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation that will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. The interesting thing about this is that we've quoted that many times as well, just to try to encourage somebody, but it's a prophetic word as well to us that death, life, height, mountains, depths, valleys, will not be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Three important things. There will be mountains in our lives that are tumultuous to climb, hard, rugged places. But we will also find that those mountains will navigate us to a place where we see victory, to a place where we can commune with God, to a place that we can call and inhabit as Zion, the place of God's dwelling among his people. And so, so the mountains are, are ultimately our destiny. The, the mountains, the higher place, the high roads are ultimately our, our end. But we have to think also about the hills and valleys. The hills are oftentimes places that bring us some comfort. They allow us to hide. They allow us to be in a place of shelter. They allow us the vegetation that grows on the hills or the animals, livestock that, that is provided as food for us while we're in the hills on our way to the mountains where we won't need any of those things. You see, the, the valley plays its role in our lives as well. I've always been convinced that wherever there's a valley, there's got to be a mountain. In fact, there's got to be two mountains because a valley is that indentation that is geographically located between two high places. So the valley is necessary. The valley is significant. The hills are places of rest. And you might be in either of those now, a valley, a hill, or the mountain. If you're in the mountain, then call out. Call out and cry out and spare not so that the people around will hear what thus saith the Lord. If you are on the hill, keep climbing, keep moving, keep going to that place of destiny that God has promised for us. And if you're in the valley, please don't give up. 
please don't give up because the valley is not the, the end. In fact, there was a valley of dry bones that Ezekiel spoke to and those bones literally got up. An entire army was established bone by bone and, and, and joint by joint to come together to march the people of God into victory. When the prophet of God spoke, we're listening for prophetic voices now. We're listening for the Lord to speak to the church, to speak to believers. And I hope I'm not talking in code to anybody that you understand that we are in a place where some of us are valley dwellers, some of us are hill dwellers, and some of us are mountain climbers. We're looking to get to that mountain. And I haven't forgotten about the scripture that simply says that if we have faith, we can say to mountains that are obstacles, be thou removed. I don't think he intends for us to remove the mountains that are necessary for us to climb. But the mountains that are obstacles, the mountains that stand in the way, the mountains that prohibit us from getting to the place of God, we can speak to those things and tell them to be gone. I encourage you today that as you think throughout the rest of this week about your hills, your valleys, your mountains, press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Press toward getting better, leaving bitter behind. Press toward perfecting the things that God has placed on the inside. And more than anything, press toward drawing closer to God. He's in the high place. He's in the high place. He dwells in the high places. And he calls us to the high places. I can't help but think of the scriptures like Psalm 91 that says that we'll dwell in the secret place of the Most High and abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Open your heart today and your ears to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. I think in these times that we're in right now, God is going to speak expressly to us individually about our households and our families, but he's also going to speak to us about our communities and our nation. And gone are the days that we just simply were entertained by church experiences that when the preacher preached until he or she were blue in the face because the people needed something to excite them or to get them happy. And the, and the preacher was just tired and drained after it was all over and people went back to living the way that they lived. And that's not everybody. Some people were moved by those things. Some people have that uncanny capacity to preach and to teach with fervor. But then there are those of us who also believe that there are prophetic utterances that are being revealed in these last days. And if we listen closely and if we watch attentively, God will reveal himself to us in the midst of it all. After all, he says this. He says that the secret of the Lord is with those who fear him and he will show them his covenant. So, so, so ask the Lord to put you in a place of Zion right now, a place where you can be in the mountain and not spend so much time in the valley. I'd rather be a mountain dweller than someone who's taken up residency in the valley. The psalmist says, I walk through the valleys of the shadows of death, but I don't fear evil because God is with me. So yes, he's with us in our valleys. He brings us respite and peace in our hills, but the mountain is our objective. The mountain of the Lord's house shall be raised up and all nations will flow into it. The mountain of the Lord's house is not your building or my building. It's not a denominational group. It's not a diocese or a synod of people. The mountain of the Lord's house is the collaboration of believers coming together to become one voice that speaks God's righteousness and God's justice and even his judgment in the earth. The Bible says that judgment will begin at the house of God. So, so we as the people of God, I'm charging you believers to become mountain dwellers. And let's remove ourselves from the valleys. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the word of God and we thank you for even the prophetic utterance that's coming through the messengers all over the land. We know that things have to change and we've experienced some ups and downs. So now it's time for us to find ourselves planted and rooted on the mounts of God. Father, I know that you've called us to be Zion, to a higher place of worship and a higher place of praise. I know that you've called us to a place where we commune with you on a regular basis. And it's not just a Sunday here or there, or it's not whether we're in the building or outdoors. Seasons are changing. So things are changing. We're changing. But Lord, you don't ever change. Your word declares that you're a God who changes not. So I pray that the consistent, steadfast love that you have to us would reach somebody right now, somebody who's not saved, somebody who's not born again, somebody on the fence, somebody who's doubting, somebody who has fear in their lives because of the ups and downs that are going on right now. I pray for peace, even in the valleys. I pray for peace on the hillsides and peace even on the mountain. Father, speak to our hearts. In your son Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, thank you so much for tuning in to the message. I hope it blessed you. I'm a little bit, um, 
uh, excited about the revelation that you're going to get when you go back and read these scriptures regarding the mountains and the valleys in the Bible. They all have significance. And you can even get as specific to identify some of the particular mountains in which the children of Israel marched and, and marched around. God spoke to Moses on a mountain and um, Jesus was crucified on a hill. Um, so there's a lot of significance and a lot of things that you can dig out and research as it relates to this as your personal study for the rest of the week. And I believe that you're going to be blessed. If you have not accepted Jesus as your savior and you wanna be saved, or maybe even you are saved and you're having some troubles and you need prayer, our prayer call number is on the screen right now. You can text your prayer request, information that we can contact you to that number, and then we will reach back to you and we'll make sure that you get connected to the body of Christ. I wanna welcome our new members to Grace for the Nations Church. We are uh, wrapping up the new members orientation for this month and we're really, really ready to get started with another one. So um, if you're interested in, in joining Grace and being a part of the Grace family, just let that be known. You can text that information as well. We are glad to see you, we're glad you're here, and we are more than more than welcome to, to or more than happy to reach out and welcome you to this part of the, the body of Christ. Till next time, God bless.